Hey, happy Mother's Day, mamas. So I'm coming to you to say this episode was recorded a while back, but I knew all along I wanted this to be kind of the Mother's Day special because the way that Caroline talks about her mom and what motivated her and inspired her to write this book, this memoir about her mom is just so beautiful. And I also experimented a little bit with the new website in SpeakPipe and asked a bunch of you to leave messages about what motherhood means to you, any memories of your mom or what you might have learned from her or what it's been like to really be a mom, especially this last year, and invited people in a very short window to contribute. Um, So I would like to do more of this and just hear from you on different topics. So I think what I'm going to do is have different prompts, questions that you can respond to, and you can leave messages, whether you're a mom, a mom with or without a business, kind of doesn't matter. It's more about really just hearing what your experiences and your perspective is because the downside of having a podcast is it's very, very much a one-way street. It's hard to kind of close that loop. So I would love to hear from you in the future. Um, For now, I have some voices of people, mamas, who um, responded with the prompts that I sent. And so they will be featured here. And I just want to say a big shout out to all of them. They're also in the show notes if you're looking for their links or their social. If you didn't quite hear it and you want to go check them out, please do. Got Heidi Wild, who's a no-nonsense shaker, baker, and magic maker. <laughs> One of my good friends. Judy Giovangelo. She is a grief recovery expert. And she actually has a nonprofit for parents who've lost children. There's Avalyn Gao, who is the Curious Mama. She also, I believe, has a podcast. Jocelyn Hubbard has custom teaching solutions. And Whitney Bean has intuitive life coaching. And you will hear from all of them here. I'm saying their names now because you may or may not be able to hear them on the recordings. It's not the highest quality, but I still love it. So I want to keep it going. Thanks, ladies. And without further ado, hope you are all having an amazing Mother's Day. Sending you lots and lots of love. Hey, this is Whitney Bean. You know, when I think of being a mom, I think about my mom and all the examples of moms that I saw around me. Something I really picked up on was, uh, you know, people that were genuine and natural. You know, kind of just themselves and kind of went with... The, the normal flow of things and really brought a lot of enjoyment and fun and light to my life. And so when I became a mom, I wanted to kind of follow that same path. I wanted to make sure that I was in flow with what my kids needed and what, what, what I needed. And I wanted to make sure that um, I looked out for their natural instincts and taught them what they needed. <laughs> so that's what I try to do with my own business. business. It's created this passion to want to teach other people how to create their best selves by being a parent and by being a mom. And I really do believe that there's a way to find balance in both of those things. I am at a tad bit crunchy on Instagram. I have a podcast called a tad bit crunchy, or you can check out my life coaching at WhitneyBean.com. What my mom taught me? Well, there's so much. I will just say that moms are so special and my mom had overcome an adversity of having polio and being in a wheelchair all of my life. She got it before I was born. So she taught me how to overcome and to work through. Uh, She drove with hand controls. She traveled the world in a wheelchair. She had a lot of different interests and creativity and uh, she had a really strong value system. And she was very honest and very articulate and taught me that life isn't fair, but it's good. Uh, She was also very loving. She would hold my hand and squeeze three times, meaning I love you. And uh, that was pretty special. And I passed that on to my children. Uh, She also knew lots of languages and foreign languages. And she taught guitar lessons to the children in our neighborhood 
when moms didn't work outside the home, that's how she was able to travel, save her money and go to Italy and France and all these places. So we also had students in our basement in an international program from MIT and Harvard. And I got a lot of exposure to a lot of diverse people. She taught me not to look at people for the color of their skin, but for who they are. And if I judge people, and not get to know them, I might be missing out on my very best friend. It would be my loss. And she also taught me to be unique and different, which I struggled with because I wanted to be like everybody else. I didn't want to stand out from the crowd. Hey, Stephanie. Thank you so much for putting together this special episode on your podcast. I think it's a really great way to honor moms past, present, and future. My mom used to always say, give me my flowers while I'm still living. And I think this is a great way to do that, to show moms, I see you, I hear you, I value you. Well, let me introduce myself really quick. My name is Jocelyn Hubbard. I am a wife and mom of five. I'm also a small business owner. I run a consulting firm called Custom Teaching Solutions, where I offer professional development and coaching to help teachers successfully navigate and adapt to cultural differences in their classroom so all students feel affirmed, welcomed, and celebrated through instruction. I'm really passionate about this work for a number of reasons, but I think mostly because I'm a mom. I have five kids and I see just how unique and special they are. And even though they've been raised by the same parents in the same household, there are still nuances that make them different. In the same note, having been a teacher and seeing 25 and 35 kids in a classroom, right? And just how different and unique they were. I saw the positive impact it had on them when I when I taught them from this place of really understanding who they were culturally and using that to design my lesson plans. So being a mom has just given me additional clarity on who I am and what I believe and what I want this world to look like for my own kids. I think that before becoming a mom, I think it would have been really great to know just how unique and special each of my own kids was going to be and how challenging it would be to, to parent them so that they each feel seen but still just so amazing. So if anybody wants to reach out to me through Custom Teaching Solutions, my Instagram handle is at I Teach Custom, and I have a Facebook group called The Culture Centered Classroom. Hi everyone, my name is Judy Javangelo, and I just would love to just share today a little bit about my mama bear. Um, my mom and I had a wonderful relationship overall, and um, I think the thing that I appreciated most about her was uh, the message that she she gave me from the time I was a young girl, which was that everything should be in moderation. And she really lived by that rule and never became addicted to anything. Both, uh, you know, my father and my mother's side of the family had a lot of addiction. And so that was a big speak to um, that Mother's Day is also National Mother's Bereavement Day. Uh, both my mother and I lost children. I lost my son, Ben, in 2009 to suicide, and my mother lost two of her children, her, my two older sisters, within a couple of years after Ben. So we both had that, you know, that bond, unfortunately, not a very happy one, but it was great to have each other to support each other through what is the most horrific thing that can actually happen to a mother. So I just wanted to share that today on this Mother's Day to remember all those grieving mamas out there who have uh, unfortunately lost their children, some of the most powerful and amazing women I've met in my journey as a grief recovery specialist and a founder of a nonprofit. So uh, just a a big reach out and and thoughts and heart-centered love to those who have been through this journey and, you know, and, and just to honor them on Mother's Day. Thank you so much. Okay, well, welcome to the show, Caroline. Very happy to have you. So today, I just want to let you guys know, so this is our kind of Mother's Day tribute. Wanted to bring you on because we met in a really interesting way. We can get into that. We met through social media, but if anybody knows how I feel about social media, that's even funnier. (laughs) But Caroline wrote a beautiful book, which I have not read yet, and I'm excited to dig into it. But it's called Unapologetic Tales of the Original Party Crasher. Awesome title that just totally is a nod to who your mom really was ahead of her time. So, yeah. So tell me a little bit about what inspired you to write this tribute to your mom. Or do you think of it as a tribute, a memoir? Like what? I do. I do think of it as a tribute. 
Yeah, well, I'd always wanted to write about her for years and years, you know, even as a, as a child. It's funny because I came across notebooks and um, my attempts to start it and questions and answers. And, and then I, I put it away, but it was always something in the back of my mind that I wanted to do. And then when she passed, which, you know, we can talk about, um, yeah. it, it became, you know, it was something I just did. <laughs> I just started. I just started to write down stories about her. And it was at first just for me. And so it's definitely, it began and, and it was throughout the whole process a therapeutic experience for me. And, and then it just became bigger and bigger than I expected. It was almost 400 pages and <laughs> I was wow. like, okay, like maybe this could be something. And if it can inspire someone, great. But it was a way for me to, to get her stories out there and um, to kind of process you know, everything. Yeah. Beautiful. So I'm just imagining, cause I had a mom who was definitely not your run of the mill mama either. So did you start thinking about this even when you were a kid? Like, did you have a, a recognition that your mom was different and not like all the other moms? Ab absolutely. She, she, yeah, the, the, you know, and there's a part of you that, that, um, I don't know if you felt this way. Uh, you're, you're a little embarrassed, you know, you think your your family is the strangest family out there and everybody else is normal and oh my God, my family is so embarrassing, you know? Right. <laughs> so there's a little bit of that, but then at the same time, there's this part of me that just loved, she she was very, uh, you know, I can tell, she was very fabulous, you know, she, she mm -hmm. sort of, to give you an idea, she was sort of a cross between Holly Golightly from Breakfast at Tiffany's, um, Auntie Mame, a little bit of Moira, you know, she dressed like Moira. She was, oh, she was just like sequins to the beach, to the grocery store. You know I mean? She always just was like glamour. And, um, it's not that she had a lot of money. It's just, but she, she just, she just had to be fabulous in some way. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she was definitely different. You know, she didn't, she didn't, you know, go to the, the PTA or teach me how to I say this in the book, you know, to teach me how to make uh, a bed with hospital corners or how to cook <laughs> or any of that stuff. But right. He definitely taught me lessons along the way by just her being her, you know, mm -hmm. not by, by saying this is what you should do or be or whatever, but just by observing, I guess, you know, and she was always very, she was like my biggest cheerleader. And so she enabled me to try, you know, so many things without fear of failure in a way, because, you know, she was always about experience, experience everything you can try this. Okay, honey. Oh, mm -hmm. it didn't work out. try that, you know, or not even her saying try this, but like, that's kind of how I, I went through life and, and at which, you know, we were talking earlier, I've had so many different, I feel like I reinvent myself every few years, you know, I've done so many things in my life. Um, and, and who knows, maybe subconsciously it's, it's because of that, because of how I grew up. So <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, I was struck by just the pictures on your Instagram and you have a little bit of video on YouTube yeah. and the glimpses of her to me, you know, I see this woman who's growing, who's kind of in, in a mother role in the middle of a time when there's a very specific, you know, maybe multiple types, but the main thing is, you know, conforming. And she's yeah. just such a non-conformist and as the title says, uh, unapologetically herself. And so what I first thought was, and this could be my own bias because I was raised by a single mother. I'm like, oh, well, she was probably just like this woman who is maybe married multiple times or just whatever, but she was with the same man, your father for how many for years? For 50 years. That's um, amazing to me. Like she, to me, that is kind of the icing on this whole story because to find a man and it sounds like he was very different from her. So right. tell us a little yeah. bit about him too. Um, he's wonderful. Yeah, they were, they were absolutely complete opposites. Um, you know, she grew up in a large city and, in, in, um, you know, New York city, my dad, was uh, was born in, in the Midwest, you know, small town in, in, in Anderson, Indiana. I mean, they were different religions. They were different, um, just different personalities. Um, but she was so, I think, you know, she, 
she definitely, she got married later in life um, for that era, for sure. Mm -hmm. And she'd always told me I was having too much fun. And marriage was the last thing in my mind. <laughs> she, you know, and she was used to dating celebrities and um, just like, just people a little bit more like her in terms of personality. And, you know, and then she met my father who is this quiet, you know, just, you know, little crew cut, and, you know, I mean, just, but he was just, she said she loved the way he treated her mother. Um, he was so gentlemanly. So mm -hmm. whatever it was, opposites attracted. Yeah. Um, and they were very much in love. I mean, I remember them dancing in the middle of the living room when I was a child and, um, she loved to dance. Oh my goodness. And that was another thing too. She was a professional dancer when she was younger and my father grew up in um, more of a household like um, Footloose, you know, so Footloose, you know, like you, you don't dance, you know, like, no, 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 no. You know? No bodily expression, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, right, yeah. So um, I think she was just a breath of, I think they both were a breath of fresh air. I know she was definitely a breath of fresh air. Um, but they both were, you know, he grounded her and um, they were just a good team in that way, I think. Mm, that's beautiful. So. Wow. Yeah, and I just think that with the stories that you tell, and I'm sure a lot of it is about her youth, but it sounds like a lot of it was just, you know, when you were around and you watching her, you were just talk, share that story about being on the beach with your mom as a baby on the beach the celebrity who oh how funny oh that's right when I write okay well so I um I was born in Hawaii um when my parents I'll give you a little backstory so my parents met in New York City and then I say they slowly migrated west you know my brother was born in Arizona and then you know my dad kind of moving up in the ranks of his career and um all of that so he accepted a position in Hawaii um they were newlyweds and uh they thought oh well we'll just We'll just we'll just live in Hawaii for a couple of years. It'll be fun, you know. They put everything in storage, um, and then I found out they had things in storage for um, thirty five years. I think. Oh, wow! Know? They just never bothered to take it out. That's expensive not... storage. <laughs> no kidding, and they had a lot of stuff. And I wound up <laughs> surprising them, taking it all out, like sending yeah. it to them. And I remember, and I'm, I'm, this is a long answer to your question, but I remember. Um, uh, opening up everything and the newspaper things were wrapped in it was like 30 you know 30 40 yeah it, it, it wow. was that was really cool for me and i yeah. i time I capsule a complete time capsule like love letter like little note love notes mm -hmm. from my mom and um pictures and um her album she loved um she loved music and she you know she loved sinatra and that whole era and signed thing i just that was that was amazing so but the, there's a fun, funny stories the next year they actually moved to the mainland so um I was like you know to, to get everything over there and then they they brought it back so that's just um ironic and pretty funny but mm -hmm. to um, answer your question about my um that the, the story on the beach yeah so I I grew up just crawling around on on the sand um in a, like this big bonnet and I mean, my mother loved dressing me up like a doll. And actually, that was the first thing she said when I was born. Literally, she said, a doll. Um, <laughs> to give you an idea. Of, um, yeah. So while well, like the other children were running around naked and, you know, like whatever, just like free and in, in, in yeah. whole, uh, I was like, you know, I think the the doc that my pe the, the pediatrician had to say, um, stop you know like she you live in hawaii for god's sake like he, she's got like you know like patent leather shoes and like stockings she's hot you know like so, anyway it was funny but um yeah so funny. i i we were on the beach and um i can't even remember who was it you you probably remember it uh it was um what a, not ava gardner ava gardner it was um somebody like that <laughs> like that um had uh just taken i mean this is the story she said she said yeah she walked you around on the beach and then wanted to take you to kahala mall which is right next to where we were um this hotel called the kahala which was like our second home uh -huh. and that was the beach we used to go to all the time um and so yeah there was a mall just down the street and I, to, to 
to this day, I still don't get it. I mean, I try to figure it out while I was writing. I'm like, well, was she trying to practice for a role or did she meet her children back home? I mean, and the fact that my mother let her take me, um, you know, was even more hilarious and stayed wow. back on the beach. I mean, and, and she's not, she was not someone that, I mean, she didn't even want people to like touch us. She was very protective. She was like, yeah. you know, <laughs> I mean, and she, you know, she was very, um, we were always with her, but I think wow. she just had this, like, she loved Hollywood. She loved celebrities. And I think in her mind, perhaps nothing could go wrong in their presence. Yeah. Like it's fine. You know, she's protected by the, you celebrity know, kryptonite. That, yeah, it's a celebrity cry kryptonite force field or something. But right. anyway, so yeah, I, I, I was returned back unscathed and <laughs> So I'm just um, picturing somebody saying, "Can I borrow your baby?" Borrow your baby. <laughs> <laughs> An hour. Oh sure. I'll get her back to you. Well, yeah. the other thing is, if it's somebody famous and you know that it's somebody, you know their name. Yeah. Obviously, you're going to be able to track yeah. them down. I guess yeah. like that might have been part of it, but it sounds like they were her weakness. That was her weak spot. Was that's why I said kryptonite, right? Like. Yeah. She All of the defenses are down, and she's like, "Here you go." <laughs> what a great story, though. Yeah, she there. There was, there, and that's the thing. There were so many of them um, that you know you'd think, "Wait, what? She did what?" You know <laughs> that I just wanted to get them all out. Um, so, but Kahala, the Kahala was a. Um, I think a saving grace for her because, you know, like I said, she's from New York City. She was very much a New Yorker. Um, so for her to even, you know, they lived in Hawaii for 36 some odd years. Um, that's a miracle in itself because she, she always, there was always a part of her that, you know, was very wistful um, and just certainly wistful for, you know, her home back in New York. And she would go back once or twice a year. Um, and um so she was very resourceful with the things that we did in hawaii I and mean, she was not um like i said she was not your typical mother so like you know when she found this hotel uh it was very glamorous she loved like uh surrounding herself with um like that like, like she created her own fantasy world if you will mm -hmm. i think her whole life quite honestly mm -hmm. and you know and finding this hotel was just there were celebrities all the time and so I write a lot about you know the sightings and the experiences that we you know we had I it was like again it was like my second home but wow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and is that you, you talk later about how you kind of did like a a tour of uh, visiting spots so yeah. share more about that that was beautiful Okay, so that, um, well, when, so when she passed away, uh, or when, when she was sick, rather, I promised to take her back to all of her favorite places in New York, really. And I mean, she had a love affair with that city, like no other, really. And what I did was I, um, I had her ashes and I, and that's what I did. I just took, I took her back. Well, okay, let me back up. The funny thing actually is I did not, she didn't leave in like an after death plan. So I really didn't even know what she wanted. I had to go by something that she had said in the past in, in, in passing really. She's like, when I die, I want my ashes scattered across Bergdorf Goodman. <laughs> which Bergdorf Gordman is a high-end department store in New York City. Right. And that just kind of gives you an idea of like her, <laughs> you know, and I, I didn't yeah. know joking, you know, or what, but I thought, I just, the more I thought about it, you know, I knew that it would be, um, it was perfect. It was perfect for her. Just, it set off a, um, a sojourn, if you will, like this journey mm -hmm. that I uh, went on with her to um, all of her favorite places in New York. Um, and so, you know, we revisited um, the Plaza Hotel and, you know, of course, Bergdorf's and just all the places that she talked to me about, you know, when I was growing up as a child. Yeah. And cool because 
it was like I saw her New York, the New York that she loved through her eyes, you yeah. know, um, just, just revisiting those places. So I, to me, it was a therapeutic experience. I'm, I'm happy to have done it. Very happy. <laughs> Caroline, I'm just trying to picture you with Ash <laughs> in a restaurant, in a department store, like say more about how you actually did that. It, it was pretty funny. Um, so <laughs> I don't know how this all, <laughs> my husband, uh, my husband was actually um, scheduled to be out there um, for, uh, on a work trip. And so it, the timing actually worked. I mean, you know, she passed away on, um, on New Year's Day, to give wow. you a timeline, which again, that's another thing I was like, she loved, you know, she always loved a good party. So I said, of course she waited till New Year's. Um, yeah, well, with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> bang, that's she did everything with a bang. Um, so my my husband about a I don't know seven eight nine days later had um, a work trip planned on the East Coast in, in New York, and um, and so I was like, well, I'll just fly out there, and then he met me up in the city um, the next day, and so he wound up like coming with me, and he you know like walk a few paces behind, and you know I'm just like I, it was all just very casual and yeah. yeah. Innocent. You're so so was it you two, your husband and your well yes. the three of you, if you include your mom? Yeah. Okay. So wow. <laughs> and you documented some of that? I did. Yeah. I haven't um about that yet, but I did. Yeah, mm. I documented it. So, but I definitely wrote about it. Um and then, you know, it, it was funny I mean because I I I was I was, I had written like, you know, I, in the act of packing up her life, I was unpacking her life. I was still learning more and more about her. You know, I had a lot of stories that had been told to me. Um, but then when you actually literally say pack up, you know, her, her belongings, you, you, for me, I, you know, I was, it was like every every door I opened, every drawer I opened, every you know thing I unpacked or found was um, like another. It's like a time capsule into her youth, um, and a lot of the stories sort of came to life. Like um, the reason I had uh, actually called it "Tales of the Unapologetic Tales of the Original Party Crushers" when she was um, younger, she had. Um, she was in like in her late I think teens or early 20s um she used to crash parties in New York <laughs> um the um like the Hollywood premiere type you know movie yeah. um mm -hmm. she was very good friends with um Ron Galela who uh was later dubbed he was dubbed the um like original paparazzi basically by news okay. I, yeah, and he uh, he be, he made um, just to kind of give you an idea. Like he 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 Jack he he loved he was he loved Jackie Jacqueline Onassis, and um, he took that picture of her walking across the street on that black and white where she was in the street. Oh yeah. The face. He took that. He um, you know he got his teeth punched out by Brando like he just he was at, you know he was incessant. Um, but as younger when he was just kind of starting out, you know they were like I say it like they were like the Bonnie and Clyde of like party crashing. <laughs> they kind of helped each other get in. I'm right. And she'd hide his table under the or not his table his his uh, camera under the table, um, you know, and he'd go off and she you know sit next to Frank Sinatra or whatever it is. I mean, so all these stories that were just you know dying to come out. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was uh, just a fun time. And she actually was written up in the New York Post. Um, uh, and this was, they, they gave her a nickname. They, they called her Harlow. Um, and um, it was originally supposed to be the title of the book, um, which is, I'll, I'll right. the story, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how that changed. But 
yeah, they they uh, said, you know, we have a new party crasher on the scene. Um, you know, she gets in merely by, um, I don't know, outdressing the rest of the female guests or something like that by looking fabulous. Or and, um, you know, they call her Harlow because she was just, she had pale, pale white skin. She loved, you know, um, Mon Marilyn Monroe and all of the, all that era. So she like dyed her hair, you know, flamboyant and she, and then she just, she just, just would show up, you know, and yeah. <laughs> come in and um so yeah I, I originally was gonna call the book Harlow um but I had talked it was talking with a girlfriend of mine um who knew her um I had written about my my time living in Los Angeles I used to live in LA and my mom when my mom would come and visit me and, and whatnot and um I had told her I'd written a scene about the two of them um and it was it's, it's this funny scene um I used to say she had uh, um, these temperature wars. She was perpetually cold, um, and so my—it's um, really funny. My she she came to visit a, a few times when I had this roommate, and um, my roommate had the heat on, and um, my mother would wake up and she'd like pad down the hall and then like turn it, you know, turn it, turn it down. So it was cooler and then come back to bed. And then I'd hear like, you know, her door open up and then she'd like go down the hall and be like, you know, turn it back. But anyway, so this happened, um, a few times. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm actually like kind of sweating myself going, yes, Lisa, you know, do this. <laughs> um, Anyway, and then I think I, I the last I heard, I, I heard the thermostat, like, I don't know if she like hit it hard and it fell to the ground or ripped it off the wall. I don't know, but it was anyway, I'd written about it and um, like just to let her know that I, I, I had, had this in the book and she we laughed and, you know, we talked about how she was just so unapologetically herself mm -hmm. and she just got away with things from just being, you know, it's it, it, somehow. Um, and then she stopped and she, and she's like, oh, Caroline, that's what you have to call it. You have to call it unapologetic. Yeah. And, um, you know, at first I was like, I, I don't know, you know, I, I got a name already for it, Harlow, you know, but the more I thought about it, I was like, yeah, there's, there's something to it that, that completely described her. So I love it. And I think that, you know, more of us are kind of striving to be that because we're told, especially with social media and everything, like there's just expectations for you to be a certain way, depending on your role or your title or whatever it is. Yeah. And it's just really cool to have somebody like that and this book to kind of inspire us to kind of color outside the lines, do the unexpected and kind of follow your urge. Like it sounds like she was very much in touch with desire and what lit her up and she just went for it. It's not like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, put my kids first or my husband first and then maybe someday I'll get to it. She found a way to weave it into her life, it sounds like, and that's yeah. wonderful. Although I, I will say when she got married and she had us, I mean, we were very much her, you know, her world that I never did not feel that. But at the same time, and this is one of the reasons why I say it was like, I learned so many things by observing. It was like, yes, I knew, I mean, we were her world and she took us everywhere and I mean I, I I know we were very very loved but at the same time you know she would go to New York for I don't know a week or two whatever and yeah I remember that I wrote about this one time it was during um Halloween and I mean it's like she knows that was the best time to go so you know th during the fall you know and I, yeah. I feel like oh she's not here you know I don't know it's hard to explain I don't know if I'm making a sense but like um because she, um, there, it was it's, it was a balance. She she did she did put herself she put herself first, but she also put us first. You know, she, right? Yeah, which um, is very hard to do as a parent. Just like you know that you're not supposed to be dead last because you have to have this energy, and you don't want to be bitter towards your children. Yeah. So the fact that she was with a man who got it, and you guys oh. were loved, but you also 
allowed her to do her thing. She probably came back with great stories and was oh yeah uplifted and from being in her element, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and the funny thing is you talk about her telling stories. She loved to tell stories. She loved, you know, and she would love like reminiscing about, you know, these stories of like the, you know, actually there's a there's a scene that I had wrote. Um it was on her um on it was like it was her 80th birthday um mm -hmm. and uh she was talking about um this time when she had met dean martin or she was waiting for dean or something like that and or was it frank i'm sorry like sometimes it, it goes to but she yeah. was like anyway waiting for them at a, at a you know she was like sitting at the table and she was gonna meet you know and um and then um you know the 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 uh, the uh, woman that they were dating at the time then you know he, they came down but they were he was with you know somebody else and she's like oh okay you know but anyway the fact that she would have no problem talking about this in front of my father you know I mean and that was right. just the, an example of the fact that he let her shine and mm. you know he loved her so unconditionally and vice versa like you know she's holding his hand across the tape like when she ta tells us these stories and um yeah they were wow. so different but they allowed each other to be themselves um yeah it's a beautiful level of acceptance it seems very rare <laughs> yeah i think <laughs> but yeah. beautiful i mean it's goals it's couples, couples. <laughs> yeah but it, yeah that's really cool so there's um you know good it's just a nice it was you know not like they didn't fight you know of course they right. had their their moments mm -hmm. but um i think also when you've, you've been with somebody long enough you've been with someone that long yeah um there's a level of acceptance too um yeah. but uh but i also you know i remember um as a young child uh you know them expo for example like you know my father's religion was always very important to him and my mother's religion was always very important to her um but uh you know my father's christian my mom's jewish and so, you know, I remember going to um, Sunday school, and then I also remember going to Hebrew school. Wow. And, um, you know, I and I was exposed to both different, you know, both faiths. But I and I think that made me um, just be more accepting of different faiths. You know, I always yeah. I believe that there's many different roads to her, right? So to God, so and in whatever universe. Um, and, were you? And I, were you bat mitzvah did you go I, through the whole thing i was not i was not my brother was bar mitzvah okay. um, i was not bat mitzvah no no you know it's funny she was like ahead of her time but she was also kind of like there are some like traditional i don't know like she was like ah it's not as it's more important for the boy <laughs> i'm like okay whatever it's less school for me um okay. yeah that's so, a, that's, yeah. A lot, that's a lot to that's a lot of work both it, of us, right? Is, and that's, I actually spoke at my brother's bar mitzvah, which um, traditionally the mother, I guess, is supposed to speak. So, oh, wow. um, but I wound up saying, um, you know, a whole bunch of stuff in Hebrew. I don't remember what I spoke. <laughs> <laughs> I was the congregation, and um, you know, and and I think that was the only time in the history of like that temple wow. that I like your sister spoke. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another example, you know, it's like, wow. that's okay, you know, you'll do it, I'll do it, okay, you know. But you know what's cool about that is that one of the things that I love about the Jewish religion and that whole piece is it's giving kids a goal, it mm -hmm. teaches them the spiritual and religious specific things that you need to learn, also another language, but the main thing is you stand up before your people so to speak right and you have a voice now yeah. and you have a message and it's a rite of passage and it's, you know you have to have courage and you practice and whatever so the fact that she allowed you up there was a way yeah. for her to give you a taste of that 
have a bat mitzvah, but I yeah. it, you know, I, I had my right of passion too. Exactly, <laughs> right. I love that. That's, your mom is a smart cookie. Yeah, <laughs> she got it in there somehow. Yeah, exactly. So how old were you when that happened? Were you older than your brother or younger? You're My brother is four years older than me. So okay. Younger, yeah. Yeah, yeah. wow. <laughs> That's even more amazing. So he was 13 and you were like nine? Nine, yeah. But I was always a little bit of a ham. Um, I yeah. loved performing and, um, you know, I that it wasn't too scary for me. It's funny, my mother, she, the, what, the reason why she didn't want to get up, she was like petrified to talk in front of anyone. Wow. Um, it's very like, like interesting. There are many layers to her. You would think, oh, really? You know, she yeah. loved dance though, like I said. So if she, if she was allowed to give an interpretive dance at his bar mitzvah, <laughs> like she would have done that. But oh, just wow. you know. so, um, yeah. yeah, so I did. <laughs> That's cool. What a great story. Wow. So she was this beautiful person. And so that's what helped her get into these clubs with the photographer. And she's like on the list because she's. She was never on the list. <laughs> but, but no, she was attractive enough to get in off the list, I guess. Right. So oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And they, they were at all the, the um, you know, the. The uh, like these balls, like the April and Paris ball, or you know, whatever the movie premiere for Taming of the Shrew, or wow. whatever it was, yeah, yeah. And um, later when I was um, you know, I had to pack up for things, um, I came across the um, the programs of. Uh, from those days and I, I, I you know, stopped in my tracks because you know there's a part of you that's like I don't know maybe it's just a story or you know right. it just really happens it feel real you know? yeah. and it's like and the and it, it gives me it gave me an idea too like how much she obviously treasured those memories and treasured yeah. that because she kept those programs from her tw I mean uh 50 60 I mean 60 70 60 years I mean, she was in her 20s, yeah. So, and the, I mean, and I've had to think like how many moves, you know, from New York to Arizona, mm -hmm. from Arizona to Hawaii, the back to California, you know, I mean. Um, those, those are her treasures, yeah. Treasures, yeah, yeah. Wow, so are those now in your possession? Are you, you have your own little? Yes, I, oh gosh, yes, I, I've kept so many things probably way too many things to remember her by but yes awesome. yeah. <laughs> i even have her license plate which is hilarious but she she her license plate was blonde <laughs> so i was like oh, this is awesome. I'll keep her license plate oh my but, gosh i love it. you have like a mini shrine slash I museum or something oh my god yeah <laughs> you could have like a little traveling tour <laughs> And I have some of her, you know, and actually, um, she had a lot of, um, I talked about, you know, her, she, she was always wearing like fabulous jewelry and, um, costume, you know, but, uh, some real, but a lot of costume, you know, and, and she just had, she, she left, I mean, there was just so much, it was like a treasure trove to go through yeah. and, um, and then like, she loved fashion and so there was all of that and and obviously I, I you know I couldn't keep everything um right. but I had given you know some items away to close friends which were um which was you know which kind of helped me because then I would see if I saw them wearing and it was almost like she was still mm -hmm. she was like a little bit of her shared yeah. with everyone um mm -hmm. so that was kind of helpful yeah weird way <laughs> that's cool and you're you're in san diego right uh no i'm in ormond orange county orange, orange county okay yeah. i'm just remembering the i forgot what it's called it's a women's museum it's tiny it's in san diego i was thinking they would love probably elements of that for a little just a little glimpse of her life would be really cool. You could probably really do something with that. Just another way to honor her. You've already honored her really well with your book and the way that what you're doing. But. 
Thank you. Yeah. Oh, so cool. So tell me a little bit about you, because I think that for people listening, a lot of people listening, you know, I have two podcasts, but The Audacious Life is a lot of writers, people who are, or people who want to write or want to write memoirs. And yeah, so just curious to hear about like, what, tell us a little bit about you, your background, and how you came to writing this book like it's it's amazing well um well thank you yeah i i you know i think about I'm like god i just wrote a book that's pretty cool <laughs> yeah. um, she was there you know the entire way just helping me um but i i'd always wanted to write i i love i loved and i still do i love writing um and i wrote um i have journals and journals and just just so you know, yep. books of just, you know, from when I was literally like, I even have my very first one. How, how old are you when you first write, you know, a few years old, whatever it is, like my very first one. And there's like mm -hmm. drawings. And um, so I always loved expressing myself with the written word. Um, I actually sometimes find it easier <laughs> to mm -hmm. do that. Um, so sometimes if I have like, something to say that's scary or important to talk to about something, you know, uh, I'll, I'll write it out first. But just to me, it helps me get my thoughts down and um, clear and I don't know, it's just easier for me. But yeah. um, I always enjoyed that. Um, but I sort of followed in my mother's footsteps when I, in, in like the beginning years, I mean, I, I, she was a model and so I did that and then, you know, got into acting and that's what brought me from Hawaii to, you know, LA. Um, and, uh, you know, I still do a little bit of that, but, you know, in Orange County, it's just not so much. Um, I brought, I, I moved down from Los Angeles to Orange County because I had, uh, started a, a manufacturing company. Mm -hmm. um it was a um it, i was in the pet products arena it's called rough rough and meow um <laughs> and yeah <laughs> it sounds like a law firm the offices of rough rough and meow it was, it was Love kind of it. Funny, pretty funny uh but yeah so we um what happened with this is um i had gotten a uh a, a new mattress a new bed that was higher than my old one and i had a little loss of opsa at the time he would he would used to be able to jump up onto the bed and you know sleep and cuddle with me and stuff and he couldn't do it anymore with this new mattress and i was like oh great you know he'd try and then fall off and i was like oh i, I gotta i gotta fix this you know yeah. so um i looked everywhere for ramp or step or some something to assist him up and I couldn't find anything and I swear at the time there was nothing on the market um and so I was like well I'm just gonna make something so um I made uh, a doggy step wow. <laughs> and um wow. it was made of this sturdy foam and it had a really cute cover on it you could zip unzip it you know wash it whatever oh cool. yeah and um friends had found out and uh you know they're like you know i'm using a bookcase and a what are you know and yeah. like i like one of those so i started you know making them and then i thought i've always been fairly entrepreneurial you know always clearly or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um so i uh was like well i'm gonna start a business and then um and then i had this idea to make um like these little doggy t-shirts with sayings on it um like uh, bitches love me was my first one <laughs> i'm gonna give you an idea so um security you know and so we had about 250 different sayings um by the time i was done uh we had like matching you can match your dog um we had baby baby clothes and collars and beds and all of that and i had it over 10 and yeah, 10 and a half years and then oh. i sold it Mm -hmm. And then, um, but that, that's what brought me down to Orange County because my warehouse was down here and, and everything was down yeah. here. Um, and I, like I said, I always feel like I've sort of like reinvented myself every few years, you know, mm -hmm. I've, I, I, um, I just wanted to try something new <laughs> yeah. and, um, and then when I sold it, I took a little bit of a break. Um, I had started to, um, uh, I was involved with the Rotary, um, so I was doing a lot of volunteer work, and um, I wound up, um, 
I also love photography, which is um, part of my background. And so I wound up traveling with um, like mobile medical um, uh, units um, to like, oh my God, we went to um, Peru, we went to um, the Amazon, we went to Mexico and I would document and I had a lot, they were um, dental clinics, most of them. And, um, but we, the last one I went to was in India and we administered um, polio vaccinations. Mm -hmm. And so that was just really exciting. And of course I wrote about it as well. So I, I, I would write in articles for the newspaper. And so I did a lot of freelance writing and photography. And um, so I was doing that. Um, so I think, you know, securitously, I, I like started writing for the paper. And then, so I was like, reigniting my love of writing and and then you know events happen in your life and then my mother passed and um and I just decided to write you know her story and and I, her passing was not you know it was um it wasn't like she was sick for a long time you know I mean it That's was fun. it wasn't overnight but she right. um, she I don't know if you know she had fallen okay um, and um, and then she just was never uh, she never really was the you know it's funny she you know you look at her and she's tiny and whatever but like she didn't she wasn't healthy you know I mean she she was uh, she like she loved Jello and pretzels and coffee <laughs> I mean like she had the worst diet um, you know um, she used to walk for miles and miles and and like you know and dance and very very like active but i think you know as she got older and she stopped she was less and less active and then her horrible right. diet and anyway so she didn't really have um a healthy base is the best i can describe it so when you fall you know i mean if you know if something happens you know your body gets heals you mm -hmm. it was very very hard for her to get past that and then she just slowly started deteriorating and um and um yeah but uh all the, this happened a few months before my wedding um and uh, so she was um she she made it to that she was um you know she always she always wanted to <laughs> see me walk down the aisle and I was also you know I I waited till later in life um to to you know to get married and and settle down um like my mother like daughter I guess a little bit you know yeah. uh, but for me I was my, I was focused on my career and my careers and you know also just enjoying myself it's like marriage was sort of the last thing on my mind too right. um, but I think you know um, and of course there's that element, you know, you don't want to, you know, you want to, you want to marry the right, you know, when you do it once, you want to marry the right person or whatever it is, you know? And so, um, when I finally did, I, you know, it just, she, anyway, she loved him and, um, very much. So, and, um, so she got to see you she got married? to see me get married. And she oh. also, um, her thing was, cause by that time uh, it was very hard for her to walk and, um, Ugh, she had to use a walker or if not that, you know, wheelchair. And she's very, was very vain. She's always been very vain. You know, she's like, I am not, you know, <laughs> using a walker to go down, you know? Um, so we um, had one of my, um, my husband's best men help her, you know, walk her down. Um, but she was determined to dance at my wedding. And um, I am so grateful that I um, I have I saw this and then I have this on um, on video uh, that my my so <laughs> my mother um, the, and, and this is funny too, the, the the song was all the single ladies you know Beyonce is all the single ladies and this is the one she chose to dance to it's really funny. Um, but she like, you know, got out of her, her chair and she just, my father led her to the dance floor, you know, and she just, she, she finally got up the energy and nerve and energy, yeah. to, not the nerve. She always wanted but the energy to do it. 
-hmm. and um and that you know and he held her while she was moving and the whole crowd was like oh my gosh you know lich has played him and um Hilarious. and uh yeah and she can really move it you know I mean it's hard for her but I mean I just I love I love that I was it's like you know um it's 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 one of the things that I'm so grateful that I um I was able to witness before yeah. she passed you know it's kind of like yes she did she did do that um it's like a last great performance too yeah. because there's a crowd and people who loved her and maybe didn't know that side of her yeah that is true like you and your yeah that's really cool it's like good way to think of it thank you I'm, I'm also grateful for um you know we had our um when she so she she was actually admitted into um hospice um towards the end because she just was you know there was nothing more they could she, her body was sort of um eating away at itself is basically how they were describing like her muscles were you know like just eating away at itself and she was just it was it's not good um and uh and so um and so um and I know I'm fast forwarding all the things in between, but um, I we had a moment where um, the two of us, uh, you know, we had a lot of just the two of us time talking about things. And um, there was this, there was a moment where I just we locked eyes, and um, and I said, I, you know, I love you, and she said, you know. I love you too, you know, I, I know you do. And it's weird, it's not, there was nothing, it was, it, we've said I love you millions of times, you know, but it was the fact that she, it, I can't explain, it's like, she said the same thing, I love you, and I said, I know, you know, it's like when, when someone tells you something and it just lands in this yeah. like unshaking knowing that you received it. Yes. Yeah. I'm mean, trying not to cry right now, but no, I know I'm getting, yeah, you know, it's like, I, you know, I say that and yeah. then she said, I know you do. And, and it, it's, it was so helpful because, you know, um, of course, you know, you think back to all the mother daughter fights you've had and whatever, you know, it's like, if I'm, I'm grateful that I had th those words said to me because yeah. You know, you could always wonder, right? You know, like, did she really know? Or I'm so sorry about that, or whatever it is. So it was just mm -hmm. um, the best gift I could have received. Beautiful. And those were actually also the last words that I heard from her. Says, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Remembering my mom's last. Oh, it's amazing when their last days. How everything just kind of can kind of come together in the most beautiful, surreal way. My mom fell into a coma and I, I actually brought her into her, she was supposed to have, she, my mom's breast cancer moved to her brain, the meninges oh. of her brain. And we knew that she was gonna have a really, really difficult time um, when that happened. Basically everything would start to shut down. She had a friend who talked her into getting a port put in her brain and we as uh, you know her children we were like oh, you know like that's brain surgery and weren't sure um my brother was expecting his first child i would i didn't have any kids yet so my kids never met their mom their grandma um but thankfully um her body actually rejected that port within 24 hours and she fell into a coma and she had all these different people around her who were not there it was just myself and I convinced I have two brothers I convinced my other brother who wasn't going to come who was sure she was just fine she's going to fly out of that hospital and come home and help with this baby I'm like you're in denial <laughs> got yeah. him to the hospital and my mom was in a coma she somehow it felt us around her she closed her eyes she her eyes were closed and she just said hey guys yep <laughs> and she just she just was like being she was very silly so she was being kind of silly. we're like how are you doing she's like yeah i'm okay you know and like, 
she was just being odd but herself she had a really quirky sense of humor and we were just so grateful that she did this with just us my aunt who had been there you know a day or so before wasn't there nobody from the outside was there it was just us it was for us yeah. and yeah. she said some beautiful things and then she her body started to shut down and she fell into deep into a coma and she was in hospice in that hospital and really didn't speak to us at all after like that was it and that yeah. was like the last performance so to speak so um special that you were able to witness yeah I mean it was just the fact that especially my middle brother had actually shown up and that he was able to to be there and be present and finally get it yeah. was yeah. like a huge blessing yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's interesting yeah. how how things yeah, you're, you're right, how things work out, especially towards the end. I mean, I remember I wasn't actually supposed to even be there until the weekend. And I said something, some because my father was, oh, she'll be fine. I mean, she was in and out of hospitals so much towards the end. Yeah. And he's like, oh, no, just come this weekend. She'll be out by then. And I was like, oh, you know, it and it, she went in on Christmas Day. I mean, it was just not the, the time, you know, so you have all these, I'm like, okay, well, right. I'm planning coming out this weekend, you know, are you sure? And anyway, um, as I thought about it, I said, no, I, I need to, I need to go out there sooner. And um, I'm so glad I did because yeah. the words were spoken, um, I think it was the day before I was supposed to be there. So I never um, would have heard that. I never would have gotten that message. So um yeah so so beautiful that you were able to hear her voice before um she passed what a gift i'm glad yeah you truly truly and i didn't you know i think I, they give you all these <laughs> when you're the only person there i was one of the proxies so they were giving me all the information and the pamphlets and this is what happens yeah. before death and eating changes and all of that and oh. What did you think about that? I didn't know. I'm like, well, why aren't they feeding her? She, of course she's gonna, you know, and they say no, because there's asphyxiation, whatever, and people, you don't. Yeah, there's all this stuff that you don't know about. And so I'm getting goosebumps just remembering all of it. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I just never knew like end of death signals, like what was typical or whatever. My brothers were, my one brother was like enraged that they weren't like, I think she ended up with septicemia. You know, you can pick up a lot of illness just being, you know, she was operated on. So her body was exposed to whatever. And her immunity was very low at that point because she was battling cancer. So it's not surprising that she picked up whatever, but he was mad about that. And then he was mad about, you know, the food thing and like care. And she, before all of that happened, one of her first days in the hospitals, I did speak to her on the phone before the the um, port operation. It she just sounded like it's. I got scared because I thought there were weird people in the hospital, but it was really her brain. Like she told me about people's voices at night and somebody in the hallway, <laughs> and I don't know if any of it was true, but I called like. The, per, the that floor administrator and I was like my mom just told me this story about whatever and they said well she has like her brain is affected by this and it was one of those things you're like who do you, you want to believe your mother because you love your mother yeah. but I don't understand what's happening to the changes in her brain and how that affects how she perceives the world right is it it was crazy <laughs> The, the, the surgery or is it because she was on her way well she had cancer in her brain because which okay. affects which was affecting her memory her perception of reality her yeah. vision multiple yeah. things were changed because of that because it literally was in her brain right and so and that happened very quickly so that was I saw her at Thanksgiving drove her to the hospital where she ended up dying days later like a like a two weeks later um I drove her there for them uh -huh. to see her and to see what to do next and that was a big decision we made 
during Thanksgiving, which that was quite the Thanksgiving. It's um, hard, right? You know, oh when things like this happen over holidays, Thanksgiving, exactly. or Christmas or New Year, you know, so there's always going to be that element of that memory. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, I'm sure people listening have lost parents or loved ones. And it's, it's so interesting to me where I'm not, a, I'm not someone who lives by the calendar at all. Mm -hmm. I'm a calendar rebel. <laughs> <laughs> and now I have two children that is not good. Um, definitely late in life, ADHD, realization, all that stuff going on, right? Like I'm kind of time blind, as you know, um, <laughs> you've probably seen, but I will find that there's just this certain heaviness that comes and it's always around death of my mom, death of my dad, a birthday, one of their birthdays, you know, something, something like that. And it's not that, that I'm talking, right? You said there was some, you were going through. You yeah. Through well, that... yeah, there's some people around me now. We've just lost three people. Oh. And, um, but I mean, when we first started talking, you left a oh. voice. Yeah. You were, was that a, was there I'm trying it was like a couple weeks ago I it was Easter or... and it was Easter, Easter because Easter was like the one some people have Christmas some people have Thanksgiving there was something about Easter it was the whole family got together the different sets of cousins and then I had my birthday near Easter my grandfather and my uncle so we would all have a shared like Easter birthday cake and all these little rituals from like, even through adulthood, these Easter egg hunts on the lawn. <laughs> My grandmother would like go overboard with that. And we are like 30 and she's telling us like, <laughs> to go look for eggs. It's just funny. And um, <laughs> yeah, just, you know, but you don't even realize what, um, what is causing this heaviness sometimes. The next yeah. thing you know, you're in tears and you're realizing, Oh, I really miss, you know, yeah. Heard the name of the loved one who's missing, or maybe it's the group of them. Yeah. And, and grief will just hit you at, oh. at the craziest times. I mean, it could any, you know, any memory, any anything can set it off. Um, it does get better, right? Though, sure. or you find that? Yeah. yeah. It gets it gets better. You're able to talk about it more and more without crying um, yes. <laughs> with me, but, um but you know I think you there it softens a little you know for sure so, yeah and they're around us I mean I think that's the thing like I've had so many you know in the beginning you kind of wish for signs um and maybe they're not there <laughs> I started reading a lot of really interesting books about signs, which opened me up more to. Oh, you'll have to tell me about that. I I, I love all that. I wanna. Yeah, I'm really into all of that. I had, we had a, I had a lot lot of signs right after she she passed. <laughs> Was it a look? You talked about lights flickering and lights flickering. Um, yeah, I mean, and and there was. <laughs> There was one thing that I had actually written about um, where she, uh, you know, okay. Do you know how, you know, right after someone passes, there's like this, there's a lot of energy and then you know, you're like, okay, I gotta, I gotta, you know, we gotta call these people, these people have to come in or, you know, planning a funeral or a celebration of life, whatever. There's a lot of, you know, and then friends are coming to your door and, and hugging you, you know, or sending you flowers and cards. There's this, yeah. And then one day it kind of stopped. Right. Mm -hmm. and, oh, and so I wrote about that. Yeah. It's uh, my, my husband had just left for the East coast and mm -hmm. I was scheduled to fly out to New York. I think it was the next day. And I was, um, I was, you know, alone in the house and, um, it was the first time that I just, it was like, it was just me. And I just like, you know, I, I remember walking into the kitchen and seeing all, you know, the flowers and cards and everything. And then I, I found the, um, 
the the what is it the the memorial book where you have people sign in and write things i realized i hadn't read anything yet and i was reading through you know how she touched everyone and then i came across um something my brother had written which i was just floored by and just oh my god and then i just mm. went into one of those ugly cries mm, yeah. where, you know, where i just like fell to the floor and i didn't even care who heard like what neighbors yeah. heard me i was just like i miss you and um and then all of a sudden i heard this buzzing coming from upstairs and you know i i laugh now because i'm like this is like the perfect horror film why do people <laughs> always go upstairs you know and away from the front door that's exactly what i did you know i'm like what's that sound um and <laughs> you know i i go up you know to 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 find out what this is and my electric toothbrush was dancing around on the countertop and I <laughs> like just on its own just turned itself oh off. my gosh and um and I just had to laugh and I said is mom is this you you know are you telling me you know, to snap out of it you know I don't know yeah. she whatever it was that you know it, that it did and I just you know I felt that that was like a sign from her and I feel like they come through an electrical um yeah yeah so that's why lights black flickering or common and oh yeah, yeah. So, but uh oh, I that's had a few of those moments and my father and my brother experienced it too and so mm -hmm. uh, for me I find it comforting you know absolutely it's so comforting so and actually I have a funny story so um I know you hadn't haven't read it yet, but it opens up with um a um um I had a discussion with the medium <laughs> And, um, you know, I just, you, you, there's a part of you that, that craves just any sort of information and are they okay? Right. Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm talking with the, this woman that, you know, knows nothing about her, but everything about her at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's describing her perfectly and she's saying, you know, was your mother the life of the party? And I see her, you know, with like all these fabulous people and she's got jewelry in her hair. And I'm like, like, oh my gosh, she, she has butterflies in her. I'm like, she used to have these butterfly pins and oh, just, wow. just all crazy things. But, um, my, um, the woman had actually uh, Leanne um, had uh, read the story after it was published and she reached out to me and she said and like I'm gonna get the chills just talking about this but she mm -hmm. said I felt your mother next to me and she was like you know she was like I, she said there was a moment where um, I, I stopped reading I put it down because I wanted to spend some time you know that evening with my fiance and then get back to the book and then my mother was like wait wait you're stopping don't you want to hear what happens next you know I mean it was just <laughs> I was like, she's like, don't you want to know what happens next? Um, so just like hearing things like that just gives me also comfort that she's okay and yeah. she's yeah. And um that she was she was happy that I wrote the book. That's not, you know, like is she okay that I wrote, you know, she loved it. She loved she said that uh, she loved finding out about other people um and also she loved when people wanted to know about her and she and that's true she i mean even in the hospital like she was she would talk to any nurse that she could to tell her all about like yes you know when i was younger i was a model or whatever i did all this stuff like she just wouldn't you know she just loved telling stories about herself and um so it's it's fitting i guess that she would like that this was going Oh my gosh! It's, yeah, I mean, it's just such a beautiful way to um, honor her. And I told you that you really made me rethink because I, you know, I'm a trained documentary filmmaker, and I just have. I started interviewing my mom before I knew she had cancer about because she. Had, I grew up in a Christian commune, and we we traveled and went to weird places, not nowhere out of the country or anything. But we have definitely have some strange stories and she had some strange people who she invited into our lives yeah so some of it's kind of cinematic too it's just like out there definitely not like any of my friends ever experienced or anything and so I wanted to interview her when I was in my 20s and she was really shy about some of it and um some of it involves the government so i can probably use the freedom of information act or something to get some of this but 
it was boring. It was the most boring interview because she was really um, holding back. Yeah, I think kind of self-conscious in a way I didn't expect because she's definitely not typically like that. Um, and then I thought, oh, I'll go to my older brother because he was a really big part of one of these stories that I wanted to get. And he was the same way. And so part of me is like, okay, this isn't meant to be told this way. Maybe there's another way. And um, and then I thought for my kids, I would love to interview her friends who are at her side during these kind of weird times. Mm -hmm. um, and so you kind of reignited that spark with me. So there's one or two that are really... I think could really fill in the blanks and whatever and I just think it would be really fun to to get their perspective and so I mean you you can find out so much about her through her friends yeah. I mean I know I did that was one of the my favorite chapters to write when was when I was talking with um, her best friend Marilyn and she had all these stories about their time in the cat skills and oh wow what they got into and um I never would have known and that's one thing you know um right. I, I I never would have talked to the people that I talked to if I wasn't you know if I didn't decide to venture into this journey and um and even like speaking with my father really I mean he was very um you know private and he didn't really show his emotions too much you know and I, I was I was starting to get to know the the man behind my dad you know um yeah. and you know you hear stories about how they first Mad. I mean, he had, he remembered like details, like she wow. was wearing a pink knit dress. At, I mean, like who remembers, you know, what, I don't even really? remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. So it just, it was incredible. And you yeah, know, the, their song and, and whatever. And it was, so it was, it was just nice to kind of connect with my father in a way that I hadn't. Um, yeah. Just, oh, that's beautiful. Relatives. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the, one of the reasons why I wanted to share this is every time Mother's Day rolls around or somebody has a baby and they're kind of, you know, everybody honors their moms for the most part on Mother's Day. But then there's times when they're like complaining, oh, my mother or my mother-in-law wants to do this or that, or, you know, they're not helping with the kids the right way. I'm like, you know, at least your kids know your mom. <laughs> they get to spend time. You have somebody to be with them, you know, and I'm coming from a very different place, but my whole thing is we don't like to think about end of life with our parents or any of our loved ones, but if you can stop and listen and ask stories, mm -hmm. like this is really good encouragement to do it while they're alive, right? Yeah. Because we forget, like I'm so close to my mom and I knew her very, very well. And I knew, we sh you know, when I was kind of like a little adult as a kid, like I was her confidant, I was the youngest, but still... The girl so I hung out with the adults yeah and I do know a lot about her but it's all in my head like I wrote some of it down I was like you I journaled from probably age 12 on but you don't think to write down these little cool anecdotal stories the fact that you did is super impressive <laughs> <laughs> um but even so with my grandmother my grandmother was really good at documenting many things about her life she was also a dancer when she was younger and when she died she before four days before she died she didn't know she was gonna die she handed me this book of pictures um from her dancing days and she she was born in germany and came over here and it was called the book of hymns h-i-m-s it was all of her former boyfriends before oh, she met my her grandfather goodness That's so, so funny <laughs> and um so she gave me that and some diaries and she died in her sleep in the hospital right before hours before she was going to be sent to um, assisted living. She said, I will never live in assisted living. I will never, ever live in assisted living. And she opted out like she and she had congenital heart failure off and on for probably three years. So this was one of those episodes where they just rehydrate. They kept her overnight, but they're like, okay, she's 89. We're going to just yeah. send her. She died. And I was so proud of her. I mean, I missed her to death. Like she was awesome. 
but it just shows that you have there's choice there you know yeah that's true yeah. that's incredible yeah well so i don't want to end on a somber note but i yeah, i just want to tell people like love your loved ones and ask more questions and try to write them down because then when they're gone it is it's, it is harder to yeah and that's what i i've been told this by a few people that it's the book has made them um you know think about their themselves their relationship with their family legacy in a different way yeah. um, and I hope, I mean, I would, I, I, I would love to, you know, in, inspire people to connect more with their family um, while they're still here. And, and, and even if they, they can't and they've passed already, I mean, to connect with those who are still around, whether it's friends or extended family. Um, cause it's funny. I mean, I, I, remember I talk with my, my husband, I'm like, do you, you know, do you know where, da, 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 or do you know how they met or do you know whatever? You know, he's like, I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, like some people don't, they don't care. They don't bother. I mean, yeah. like, I don't know, but, um, I think something happens to you when someone does pass and you, you're like, oh, if only I knew, you know, I exactly. would have this or that, right. So exactly. why not ask now? Why exactly. not? Have, I mean, they probably love. I mean, if they're anything like my mother, they would love to talk about it. Exactly. No, it's um, another way to honor them while they're here and really listen to these rich stories. And, you know, we're such a, like, we're documenting so many things on our cameras and phones and social media, but it's always just the frosting. Mm -hmm. It's like the best photo, the best, whatever. Some people, you know, capture some of the yeah. other stuff too. But I just think these real conversations mm -hmm. that, tell about who you are if through your relatives right like the background is really important and um yeah don't leave it up to memory because it's easy to forget <laughs> yeah. that's so true yeah. well i'm happy to have inspired you in some small way to do your documentary or get yeah. that that's exciting i i we'll need to hear about it when you're done. I want to see it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I definitely want to talk to her friends while they're still here. I know there's one who is kind of her wing girl and I think she's passed. Like that's the thing. I can't even find her. Um, she had some mental illness too. So, but yeah, I think um, you definitely inspired me, whether it's a book, a video or whatever, who knows what. So thank you so much for sharing this beautiful beautiful story and i want everybody to go look so your author name is caroline nadine helsing yes. the name of the book is unapologetic tales of the original party crasher yes. and so can people find this amazon anywhere yeah currently it's just it's on amazon um and um i you know it's on kindle and paperback i just finished a, a large uh print version um for um us that need help with our eyeballs or yeah yeah you know, I just did. um and um i am about to embark on the audible journey so that's gonna be fun yeah, I had a few requests and, you know, that's sort of how I, I write anyway. I would talk out the scenes, um, you know, and I have some performing in my background. So I thought this would be kind of fun, a uh, fun project to do. Um, so, so that would be in the, in the future, but right now, yeah. Kindle. Oh, that's wonderful. I actually have a friend who's battling cancer in her eighties, literally just got her an iPad and del delivered it yesterday for audible. Ah. loves reading and her eyesight is not so great mm -hmm. so audible is audible. yeah audible's fun you just you know awesome. I, i'll listen to it while i'm doing the dishes or walking or, or whatever um yeah. at the same time you know there's always there's something about holding a book and i love it both. i like both like the tangible the flipping of the page you know exactly um, so that's fun. But yeah, um, you can find out more on my site, carolinenadinehelsing.com. Um, and then, um, as you mentioned on, on the socials, yeah, I've been, I didn't put a lot, I didn't put any photos in the book, uh, but there are a ton of pictures that I, I try and post something daily um, 
you know, with uh, like a excerpt from the book and little tidbits on, you know, my childhood or, you know, my mother's, um, you know, our, our time together. Um, and I make it fun. And so people have been saying, wow, this is really cool accompaniment to the to your book, you know, I'm reading the book and then I'm looking, you know, I get oh, I, fun. social, I see the photos. So, so I'm like, oh, that's kind of, that's, that's nice to hear. You're so. doing a great job. Yeah. No, I worked with a lot of authors before this doing like social media and strategy type stuff. And I love that you're doing that because you're kind of keeping the story alive and pulling people back and it's helpful for me too. You know, that was one of the things um, I'm like, God, what do I do when I'm done writing her story? It's like, you know, I mean, she's, when you're writing, they're still with you, right? And mm -hmm. so it was like my happy, safe, happy place that my mother's still here because she's still in my mind. And, um, you know, how is it going to be when I'm done? And it has, it has been nonstop, you know, and I'm still thinking of things and I'll put that on, on social or, um, but now just talking to other people, um, about it is, is, is so nice and to get feedback has been so, um, so nice. Just the feedback on how it's touched people is, it's mm -hmm. heartwarming. It made me, um, y you know, it, 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 um, solidified the fact that, you know, my writing the story was, there was a reason to do it. You know, I mean, if I've touched other people, then it's all all for the better so oh, I'm i love it <laughs> never have to be done you can just keep adding to it and you can maybe yeah. have people send you their stories about their mom i mean who knows what it'll turn into right oh yeah, yeah. you're firing yeah. a lot of us <laughs> so. oh, sounds yeah. very cathartic and an awesome way to honor her and inspire the rest of us so thank you so much caroline I appreciate yeah. your time <laughs> All right, well, we'll go look for your book and I'll have all of your socials and your website in the show notes for everybody to go take a look. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Sure. Bye.